For those of you that are familiar with my channel, you will remember that some time back I did an interview with Dilbot Gill, who is the team principal and CEO for Mahindra Formula E Racing. While I was pretty psyched out to talk to someone from a Formula E team, I soon realized that some of my viewers still don't really know what Formula E is. So in this video, I'm going to try to change that. If you weren't able to pick up on it from the name, ABB FIA Formula E is an all-electric racing series that held its inaugural season back in 2014. Now, Formula E as a concept got its start in early 2011 when the president of the FIA, John Todd, had a private meeting in Paris with the Spanish businessman Alejandro Agat. Formula E's PR team quite romantically states that the idea for an all-electric street racing series all started out as nothing more than scribbles on a napkin which I think is a bit much, but it makes for a good story, I suppose. Anyways, one thing led to another as those scribbles led to the first ever Formula E race being held at the Beijing Olympic Park in 2014. In that inaugural season, there were 11 races held in 10 different cities, the final two being held in London. This right here hits upon one of Formula E's first novelties, street circuits. A series such as Formula 1 only has about 5 street circuits on the calendar if we look back to the 2019 season, but in Formula E, every single race is held on a city center street circuit. Formula E has done this in an attempt to make these races more accessible by bringing the show to the people rather than the other way around. As we will see throughout the video, Formula E is very focused on creating the best experience for the fans in a bid to make motorsport more engaging and exciting. But before we get to that, time to go over some basic info. The great thing about a Formula E race is that practice, qualifying, and the race itself are all completed in one day. There are two practice sessions, the first being 45 minutes and the latter of the two being 30 minutes. Qualifying happens later in the day and is an hour in duration. Cars go out into the track in groups of six, the groups being determined by your place in the driver's championship. When on track, each driver has 6 minutes to set their quickest lap times with their power units being tuned to the max output. After this, there is something called the Super Pole Shootout, in which the top 6 drivers will get the chance to challenge for pole position. Each of the 6 drivers will get the track to themselves for their outlap, and when they cross the start-finish line for their flying lap, the next driver is permitted to leave the pits and get onto the track. If a driver qualifies for pole position, they automatically receive 3 World Championship points. Moving on to the actual race itself, which the folks at Formula E rather cleverly, I think, refer to as an E-Pre. An E-Pre is 45 minutes plus the final lap, which again I think is a bit unnecessary, but other than that it runs like pretty much any other race. The only two exceptions to this are Attack Mode and Fan Boost. The best way that I can explain Attack Mode is by equating it to those arrows that you can drive over in Mario Kart to get a speed boost. Drivers can opt to take the slower line, which sacrifices time, but they are given an extra 35 kilowatts of power which they can then use whenever they like, so there is some strategy to it. Fan boost is again a way for drivers to get a little bit more juice out of their power units, but this time, if you guessed it, the fans decide who gets the extra power. Voting for fan boost starts 6 days before a race and goes all the way up to 15 minutes into a race. This way, the fans get to keep the team strategist on their toes. This extra power that a driver may receive from fan boost can be used in the second half of the race, and the power advantage itself only lasts for about 5 seconds. When it comes to the points, the point distribution is the exact same as what we see in Formula 1. Those that finish in the top 10 are in the points, and whoever completes the fastest lap of the race also receives one additional point. Okay, that was quite a bit of basic information, and to be honest, I probably could have fit in more. But, this is a YouTube video, not a college course, so just go search up the rest of it if you're really that interested, because now, we're gonna talk about something that's a little bit more interesting. The cars. Now, Formula E cars can be split into three different generations. The first generation car was also known as the Spark Gen 1 car, and it featured a chassis developed by Delara, a battery system developed by Williams Advanced Engineering, and electric motors developed by McLaren. These Gen 1 cars had a power output of 190 kilowatts, which is the equivalent of 250 horsepower, and this means that these cars only had a top speed of 140 miles per hour. 
It also takes three seconds for the car to get from zero to 100 kilometers per hour, which seems like a good time until you compare it to the Tesla Model 3, which does it in a little under 3.5 seconds. Another issue with these Gen 1 cars was battery life. While the Gen 1 car was in use, drivers actually had to use two cars for qualifying and the actual race itself. During the race, there would be one pit stop in which the drivers hopped out of their car and rushed to strap themselves into the other car. The Gen 1 cars were an okay start, but there were a lot of issues that needed addressing. So it was no surprise that the Gen 2 car ushered in a new era of Formula E. These Gen 2 cars are better in almost every way. First off, the battery efficiency is improved drastically. The energy storage is doubled, which means that driver switching cars is a thing of the past. Another impressive improvement according to Mahindra's team principal is battery density. He said when comparing a new battery to an old battery, the new battery weighs about 60 kilograms more, but has double the amount of energy in it. In addition to these storage improvements, the battery is also about 50 kilowatts more powerful, which means the car has a new top speed of 174 miles per hour. The new power unit also allows the cars to accelerate from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.8 seconds, so it does get marginally better in that capacity. Other than powertrain specs, a key area for change can be found in the braking system. Gen 1 cars use regenerative braking almost as a supplement to the actual mechanical brakes placed on the car. Drivers could adjust how much regen braking they wanted, but there was always the possibility of lockup or spin out. The Gen 2 cars also have a brake by wire system on the rear axle, and as far as I can understand, the purpose of implementing this is to give the regen system a larger role in the braking process. In addition to all this, the Gen 2 cars, for the first time ever, allow the use of interchangeable brake cooling ducts, which is yet another area for the teams to play around with. And then of course there are the FIA approved halos like the ones that we can find on F1 cars. The only difference with the halo on a Formula E car is that they have LEDs built in which glow magenta to indicate the driver's engaged attack mode and blue to indicate that the car is in its regular race mode. The Gen 2 cars will continue to be used until the 2022-2023 season when it will then be replaced by the Gen 3 car. As of right now, the Gen 3 car is still largely a concept, but many advancements and changes are slated to be introduced along with this new car. Firstly, the dimensions of the car are being decreased in pursuit of weight shedding. Instead of 900 kilograms, the new weight target will be 780 kilograms, and that includes the driver. Power will again receive an increase, but I see this more as an evolutionary trait rather than a groundbreaking improvement. Something that will be a big change, albeit a controversial one, is the new battery regen system. First off, with the new system, the regen will have to handle all of the braking on the rear axle, as there will be no actual hydraulic brakes used on the rear axle itself. With the past cars, the regen system only collected and deployed power off that rear axle. However, with the Gen 3 car at MGU, or Motor Generator Unit, has now been added to the front axle. This MGU on the front axle can collect energy, but cannot deploy that power the same way the rear axle can. This being said, the new regen system now allows the car to recover energy at a rate of 600 kilowatts when under braking. Another energy-related novelty being considered is fast charging. In order to allow for longer races, it has been proposed that a fast charging pit stop be introduced in which flash charging rates of up to 800 kilowatts can be used to refuel the car. Drivers will be allowed one fast charging pit stop per race in which they can stay stationary for up to 30 seconds. Though, if strategy dictates otherwise, drivers may not choose to stay for that entire allotted time. Whatever your opinion on the Gen 3 car may be, it would be fair to say that there will be a certain element of change not only to the cars themselves, but to how the series runs. This leads me to my final point, the significance of Formula E. What does all of this technical gander really mean, and why should you care? Well, Formula E should hold some importance in our minds because simply put, it's the future. If you haven't noticed, almost every manufacturer is now producing or in the process of producing an electric car. This desire from automotive companies to not be left out from the electric car market has gripped the entire industry, and motorsport is not exempt from this phenomenon. Race series like Formula One have long been a laboratory for automotive manufacturers, testing many new advancements and forcing innovation through the pressures that come with auto racing. However, as I stated, manufacturers in recent times have become increasingly disenchanted with the gas-powered car and have turned much of their attention towards creating electric cars. This means that large-scale manufacturers such as Mercedes-Benz, Audi, Porsche, BMW, Mahindra, Jaguar, and many others have all invested in Formula E 
This large-scale investment has also had a sort of domino effect as the presence of these big manufacturers has drawn in good driving talent. And in my opinion, that is the catalyst that any new race series needs. With former F1 drivers such as Felipe Massa and Stoffel Van Duren, Formula E does have a highly talented grid. What's more, Formula E, in my opinion, has been receiving the proper support and attention from the FIA that it needs in order for it to grow into that role of a premier racing series like Formula 1. The reason I think this is that starting next season, Formula E will be granted world championship status by the FIA, a title heavily attributed with Formula 1, the World Endurance Championship, and other big-time race series. Then there's also the subject of the super license. If a driver participates in enough races in Formula E, he or she can earn a super license, which is again a qualification given to those driving in Formula 1. Formula E has all the ingredients to become the next big thing in motorsport, and in my opinion is a race series that is much more poised for the modern world. We may not be ready to accept the idea that one day F1 may be overtaken by something else, but Formula E makes a lot of practical sense both for fans and constructors alike. In terms of solidifying its place in the motorsport world, the cars do need to get faster, but races are already relatively fun to watch, there is a huge upside both commercially and technologically for the manufacturers, and then of course races are very accessible for the fans. So Formula E, ready or not, here it comes.